Is capitalism a harmful or beneficial economic system? And after much research, both for this project and not, I have come to the conclusion that capitalism, particularly the purest, unreg most unregulated forms of capitalism, such as those championed by neoliberal philosophy and laissez-faire capitalism, are not ultimately economically sustainable because they do not they're not cohesive to the public good, the environment, and that hurts the overall health of the economy as a whole. Now, it should be said, most countries don't operate pure capitalistic systems. This is something that exists on a very wide spectrum, and it should be looked at across that spectrum. Now, the markets and everything that really have our world has been built around affect all of us, from what we pay to put gas in our car, electricity, food, or even our tuition. That's all markets. That's all businesses, economies. That's really the basis of all of it. Now, if we're to start from the beginning, what is capitalism? Well, according to Investopedia, capitalism, also known as the free market economy, is the, involves the privatization of things such as, you know, means of production, land. Basically, capitalism, one of the cornerstones of it is privatization of everything. Everything's private owned, as opposed to socialism, which pure socialism, which would be everything publicly owned by the government. Now, all right, let's start here. So, capitalism really comes about and really starts growing and evolving even before Adam Smith here, 18th century Scottish economist, really names the idea and starts really working with the capitalism of idea we know today, but it's long before that. But it really comes out of the breakdown of feudalism. Now, feudalism, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, put it simple, feudalism was a bad system. It was a very strict, very rigid system that involved a lot of interconnecting loyalties and peasants working the land. There was really no room for private ownership anywhere. And when that collapsed, well, the alternative is from no one owning anything to people owning things. And that really starts a seed that starts to grow. But we'll put that aside for a second. Now, we got to look at first, what is one of the main issues with capitalism? Well, here's the funny thing. Capitalism actually does regulate markets Things, everything will balance out eventually, or things will just become irrelevant and they no longer need to exist in the eyes of the market. And, you know, things will go down, up and down. The issue is, the world's more than just markets. Take, for instance, why most countries subsidize food production and agriculture. We learned this in the Great Depression. When food prices go up, up and up, prices go down, to eventually the point where farmers can't afford to be farmers anymore, which means production then drops precipitously as all the farms were closed, which then means prices go up precipitously, which everyone has to pay for because we all need food to survive. This becomes a big issue. Yes, the market will eventually find equilibrium. If you cause a famine in the meantime, that's not worth it, and governments realize this, so they will pay a, a frankly astounding amount for any shortfalls just to keep farms going because it's deemed as important. The U.S. government actually has whole caves of cheese because in the Great Depression we had to kill our, all our cheese cattle and everything that produced milk. And it, it took a while to get back going again. So now we have literally stores of cheese, just in case. <laughs> now, the other reason, thing to look at why capitalism has problems, well, the most smart way to look at that would be, why do many countries choose to have national industry? Well, a couple reasons for that. Particularly, well, let's take a look at America first. America has a very diverse economy. We're not dependent on any one financial sector for all our GDP. Countries like Iran, Iraq, Russia, yada yada, energy producing countries are. Now, they tend to pretty much all own, all have state owned oil companies, all gas companies, all that stuff state owned because, well, if they let a private company control all that, suddenly that private company is more powerful than the government in many regards. Same thing with Panama. The Panama Canal is owned currently by the Panamanian government, and it is run by a company run by the Panamanian government. Most countries also have national airlines. The United States gets around us by having a massive military, so if we need to fly anything anywhere, we can just do that using our massive defense industry and infrastructure, and we're fine. But for other countries, it doesn't really work that well. All right. On to this issue. One of the other key issues with capitalism many people end up running into is wealth consolidation. Now this is an early example of still arguably the richest man in history, 
This is Jakob Fugger, otherwise known as Jakob Fugger the Rich. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, by the time he died, now this is an old figure, he was worth over $400 billion. That's more than Bezos, that's more than Musk. This man was so insanely wealthy, by the time he died, he accounted for 2% of Europe's GDP. Not Western Europe, not just France, Germany, no, all of Europe's GDP. 2%. Whole thing. And those problems that come from a man like that still exist today. They can impact elections. They can practically bully entire small, poor nations by themselves. They, they have an incredible influence and ultimately can undermine government influence. Another thing that happened during his lifetime, that wealth, extreme wealth inequality can happen, is it, well, it can start a lot of discontent and revolts. Now, the Peasant Revolt, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, was a war, and it was a peasant, it was called the Peasant War. And during it, in short, long story short, it was crushed, badly. This dude funded a lot of the crushing. By the time it ended, over 100,000 peasants have died, and land reform and everything was still 100 years or more away. It was bad. But, that was just the way it was. Now, let's take a look at this, really one of the last issues we're going to look into, and goes back to the central port part of our thesis, is capitalism at its core is not really concerned with ethics in the slightest. Like, only very rarely, because a market will sometimes be created for ethical products, that will start something to exist. For instance, Dow Chemical, the company that makes Tide, the detergent, quite literally dumps detergent down the necks of dogs, particularly puppies and like beagles, to test what happens if your dumb child drinks Tide. That is abhorrent to a lot of the people who learn about that, which means there is a serious market for animal testing-free cosmetics and detergents. That's an example of people's own purchasing power being used to create a different market. But let's talk about an instance about the Stackler family, Purdue Pharma, and the opioid crisis. Now, the Stackler family, which owns Purdue Pharma, has largely been blamed for the opioid crisis as a whole. Now, this had been going on for 10 years. The legislation's been going on for years. And, well, according to the, basically how it has shaken out now, it's still playing out, but according to the U.S. Justice Department website, They've been charged with the biggest, one of the biggest fees ever leveled against a company. They've been charged billions of dollars for, like, hundreds of lawsuits. But, no, none of the Stackler family's been arrested. They're all very, very rich. They all still have billions of dollars. They've been forced to apparently forfeit the company, which they've been trying to get around, even having to pay some of the lawsuits by declaring bankruptcy, which will typically protect you from additional things, and they can just rename the company. A lot of legal jargon there. But... Long story short, the Stackler family, what they did was, they had a product, Oxycontin. It works well. In fact, it practically sells itself. It works well, there's a demand for painkillers. I mean, other than just straight morphine, it was the best, you could stick it in a pill, and it worked. Now, they could have made a ton of money just off that, but no, they pushed it further. They apparently downplayed its addictiveness, and broke some of the laws involving, like, bribery of doctors and pharmacists to prescribe more of it. Which people have been blamed for flooding the streets and everything and creating the opioid crisis in many regards. Capitalism didn't care about that. I mean, sure, they broke some of the laws and legislations, but the really the only reason the U.S. government even started getting on their back is someone's head has a role for creating the opioid crisis. So the public wouldn't stand for it. But the truth is, I mean... We sell a lot of things that are addictive in this country. I mean, cigarettes are still a thing. That doesn't really matter to people. In, in, in summation, you have a very large effect on what you buy. Like, like I said, what about the detergent? You can choose what you want to buy, when you want to buy it, and where you want to buy it. And that will have a big effect on the economy. Because if you don't do that, the economy does not really care about you. Without regulation, without any checks and balances, I mean, if a, it doesn't, if they don't, it doesn't matter anymore. Profits, an economy can be balanced, but also be very unhealthy and leave a lot of people dead. And at a certain point, we have to ask ourselves, is that worth it? That is all.